Princeton is out of it too. Oh yeah. They've been out for years. Who's the president of Company now? Anybody I know? Well, I'll, I'll give you a real brief history of it. Let me get this set up here. Uh, let me just put a date stamp on here. This is uh, no, November the 20th. No, it isn't. No, it's not. 19th. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I had to buy a watch to put the day and the dates because being retired, it's the hardest thing in the world to keep their days up. Well, you don't have anything to refer to. Uh, you know, like it's Monday, I have to go to work. Uh, okay, so this is November the 19th. Uh, we're in Palm Desert, California. We're talking with uh, Lowell Weeks. Uh, most recently retired general manager of the Coachella Valley Water District in terms of his professional life. Okay, now, uh, and I have more tape if that one runs out. Um, Bookman was actually purchased about seven years ago by a company called RMI, Resources Management International. And RMI is uh, on the energy side. They do energy work. Bookman, of course, does water. So it was a good match. About four years ago, RMI was purchased by a company that came to be known as Navigant. It's a made-up name. And Navigant is out of Chicago. And they, uh, what they've done uh, over the past four years is they have purchased a number of uh, uh, highly thought of consulting firms all over the country. Not in water and energy, in everything, financial and claims, and uh, a number of different consulting areas. Well, they bought RMI, and in so doing, of course, they dragged Bookman Edmondson along with it. <clears throat> so uh, we are the only water resources practice in Navigant. Like I say, they do other things. They do finance, they do insurance claims, they do liability stuff. Uh, and of course, the RMI people uh, have been working for the governor here over the past six or seven months on the California energy crisis. That's horrible if they work for him. Uh, so that, that's where that's where our energy Who was are. RMI? Who was RMI? Lloyd, I think Lloyd Harbago. That's it. That's and, he started that. Right. I had uh, forgotten his name. That's the reason I was asking you. Yeah, and he's still around too. He's in Sacramento and he's opened a restaurant. Up there. A restaurant? Yeah. That's he a, bought a restaurant. That's actually. the quickest way to lose your money. I, <laughs> I had a daughter in that business for 30 years. And all the lawyers and dentists were buying restaurants and they all lost their shirts. That's it's a tough business. Yeah, it is as tough as it can come. Okay, now, on all of this, you want me to go back to the first remembrance of Colorado River problems I can remember as a kid? Yes, I do. Uh, I know that you were born in the Imperial, Va Imperial Valley uh, and that you, uh, one of your early jobs was working for IID. Uh, I think your family had a farm or a ranch or something. Well, so, so yes, yeah, so I want you to go back there and just bring us up. Just, just uh, I, I talked to my wife the other day or some of the things. Uh, I should have been a history professor rather than an engineer. I love history. That's an avocation. And part of it, I guess, because of my family and uh, my wife's family. My wife's grandmother was probably the second, I hate to use the term, but white woman in, in Pearl Valley. At least she was within the first ten. And um, if you want to read a good history, are you familiar with the first 30 years of Imperial Valley? I'm aware of it, yes. Well, they have a family history in there in their early days in that. So after getting married, that made it. Plus the fact when I was working for Imperial Irrigation District on the survey party, we were working in Yuma on a drainage problem on the, on the All-American Canal. As we drove home, we saw a celebration down on the All-American Canal just as it got into Imperial Valley. We stopped. And King Neptun became my father-in-law. He was floating down the canal, bringing water into the All-American Canal. So that was kind of interesting on that. Go back. In the early days, everybody had something to do with the farm. 
And when I first was born in the little town of Hopeville, the Pearl Valley was a dairy country. There was no such thing as vegetables. It was dairy and that was probably about the whole thing. There were probably five, seven, eight creameries throughout uh, Imperial Valley, and you didn't have it for milk, it was strictly for making butter. And my dad, we started on the dairy, and I was always glad they sold it when I was about three years old. I was nothing I could think worse than be milking cows. And, but he bought what was called a milk route where he went out and picked up the milk from the dairies to take them to the creamery. And uh, we also had a little uh, farm where he had the cows. He kept that up till World War II, so that I was gone. And we moved in to call the town around about 10 acres out from town of Hopeville, about a mile and a half out. So yes, we had the farm but then we were in the other area. Now, remembering Colorado River, if you want my background, Colorado River, when I grew up, before any of the dams were on the river, that river was just, as you know, heavy with silt. And so during my grammar school days and early high school days, there was no such thing as concrete line ditch. Now out on the farm, the head ditch, water that got out of it, it was wide enough that you could take a team of horses and had kind of a V-shaped plow that you could plow the mud out to keep your ditch open for the next irrigation season. The little place where we live in a town, 10 acres, the ditches were smaller and that was the job of my younger brother and I. We shoveled out that silt every fall to open the ditch so we'd be sure to carry water in that ditch. So see, silt was a horrible problem. We're Another, talking about silt that was brought in, in by the river. In by the river. Well, you know, you've heard it before, and it was so common. Uh, water was t too thin to drink and too thick to plow, and that's just what. All uh, in those days when it was just um, alfalfa without having the heavy equipment, tractors and things, all the land, as you let the water out of the ditch and flow down your alfalfa, we called them checks. They'd be maybe 100, 150 feet wide or border so you have a flood the irrigation into another. The upper end would always get high. And you were having to take these little Fresnos that probably moved a third of a yard of dirt and keep trying to level that out because with the alfalfa the silt would grow. Uh, as a dairy country, you had to have water for your cows. Now remember, all water is in Colorado River in the Pearl Valley. So we had reservoirs or ponds, whatever you want to call it, they would call it both. Oh, twice the size of this room. You would dig it out because you couldn't go very high because your height was about of the elevation of the water coming out of the canal. And that's where you store water for your cows and you have it so they could drink outside and settle the water. I don't recall how often, but these reservoirs would silt up and you'd have to clean them out so therefore you had a a small standby while you had it up. You'd let it dry out and the silk would crack and if it was probably that deep, shapes, okay, and you just put, if it was, if it was hard, you'd put a crowbar and break these out, you pick those up, you carry them out. Now that's how you cleaned off the but that's silk. The other problem that I can remember was Sucker fish, what's the official name of it? Big mouth sucker, the one they're trying to replace right now. Okay, well, there are. It's a trash fish. Right. Every once in a while, well, I'll start over. The outlet from your ditch to your farm, uh, irrigation farm 
was we had what we call a little head gate, a concrete pipe, a couple of joints that you put in. But on the interior of the of the dish, it was square, and you had a slide gate, metal gate, so you could determine how much water. There's times when the those little fish would come in that they would block it up. Well, if you open it full, sure they flow out. But if you only had it up like that, they'd block out. And I remember we used to have to take pitchforks and go down and throw those things out of the out of the head dish. So you see, I'm not much interested in saving the. Is it the razorback sucker that you're talking about? Is that whatever that thing is? Yeah. I'm not interested in saving those things. <laughs> I hear people say, oh, we just wrecked the Colorado River. All it is is just a clear trout stream. That's right. But they don't know what it was in uh, the old days. What, give me a sense, Lowell, of what era, what time period we're talking about here. We're right. talking in the early 20s, okay. early 30s. Okay. It all changed with the construction of Hoover. After that, we had clear water relatively clear water. And you know what you get to the metropolitan area. That's the same type of water we got down in Peru. People often ask me, how did I get in the water business? Well, in those days growing up, we had no internal water in the house. And so our water system was uh, 60s, 80 gallon oil drum out on the side of the dish, whatever that size of those oil drums were. And a typical day, my sister, just older than I, we'd get home from school. We'd go out, get two or three buckets, three or four gallon buckets of water out of this reservoir, take it in for the night and the next morning use. Then we would turn that barrel over, wash it out, Stand it up, and we had a bucket with a rope. We dip water out of the out of the canal and put in there, and it would settle overnight. So the next morning, we'd go out and get water for mother to have during the rest of the day. Now, if there was a storm on the Gila River, I've seen times when that barrel would be two thirds full of mud over just one night we have to dump it out. So people don't realize how today what that river was in a state of nature. It wasn't any fun. What what was the mood in Holtville and where you lived in the Imperial Valley when Hoover Dam was proposed and finally funded and and moved ahead and ultimately was built? Uh, did people understand before it was built what it was going to do? Uh, were they well, they was it knew, a good thing or a bad they thing? knew uh, what we, we were going to have water. And I'll tell you one thing, and this finally came out. Well, and I kept insisting to our attorney, Mr. Redwine, in the Arizona versus California, that um, what it was, the farmers in my area, and I can remember the district director coming over, because he lived about a mile from our farm. And we consider him the father of the All-American Canal. I'm sorry, who's him? And Mark Rose. Okay. He was the director of Imperial. We consider him the father of the people in Holtville. He and Evan T. Hughes, who was the chairman, were on opposite sides of everything. My mother's folks went to Imperial Valley, in, I think, in about 1910 or they may have been in nine, and my father came in there in 1910. And I've heard my mother talk about how Mark Rose in, during World War II was out trying to sell the All-American Canal. He was a hard-drinking son of a gun. My grandmother was a TT, teetotaler, WT, WCTU, women's Temperance Union, whatever it was called. Women's Christian Temperance Union. She told him she'd vote for all American Canal if he'd vote for prohibition. And he swears up and down that he did everything he could to do that. But anyway, that's beside the point. 
So that's how I got started in water. Now later on, I became very interested because my wife's folks went from Nebraska to Peora, Arizona in about 1892-93. They were farming beautiful crops. Right at the turn of the century, they were farming and all of a sudden they didn't get any water. And so they were told, look at your deed. So when they saw the small print on the deed, they found out that they were only entitled to surplus water. And you know how much surplus water there is in Arizona and California. So they had to look for somewhere else. And so Imperial Valley was opening up in 1901, 1902, and my wife's grandmother went over by herself and uh, traveled through Imperial Valley and picked up their homestead. Her grandfather used up his homestead rights in Nebraska. So he told his wife, he said, now you just look for where there's heavy mesquite. There's a lot of mesquite and you know it's rich soil. My folks came out of the South. They were living in, my father was living in East Texas. They had cotton land, cotton gin the old land quit producing. So they went to West Texas one year to look at it. My dad said the most beautiful cotton he had ever seen. So they went back, sold everything, bought in West Texas. By three years later, they were hauling the water to keep their animals alive for 20 miles. So they started out, no water. And so he sold out everything he had, and they had quite a bit when they left East Texas. He sold out everything he had for a rent of a boxcar to Imperial Valley for $70. So water has been in my background as long as I can remember. So, no. so your family, your father, your mother and father moved from West Texas to the Imperial Valley. They moved from West, Te uh, yes, from East Texas to West Texas, not knowing each other, but from different areas, but all this happened about the same time. And then they met in Imperial Valley after they both families had moved there. And see, my wife folks went in in 1901. They had to even wait for the water to get into the canals. And when they moved to the Imperial Valley, when they began their operation, the source of the water that they had, of course, was the Colorado River. But tell me, how did the water get from the river to the farm? Through the old canal system in Mexico, through the uh, Anlin heading, rock, rock wood check gate, of course, that was built later. And the water went down into Mexico into the old Alamo River Channel and brought around to south of the Imperial Valley. The famous Sharps Heading was a canal that raised the water out of the old channel and put it into the irrigation ditches headed for Imperial Valley. Okay. And where then were they when that canal uh, breached because of the railroad accident and the Salton Sea was formed? That was my, my my in-laws were living there, but my parents weren't there. Yet. Yeah, they weren't there yet. No. Okay. Now that may be my doctor. No problem. I want to take it. <laughs> I don't want you to have to say this it twice. This doesn't have anything to do with what you're in, but okay. I can remember when the drought and the floods on the Colorado River would See, and I don't recall right now whether it was the drought of 33, 34, and the floods afterwards, or the floods first. You can always look that up somewhere. But uh, I've seen the Colorado River when uh, you could walk across it and not even get your ankle wet. There used to be signs during that time in the gasoline station restrooms in Yuma, flush the toilet. Improve value needs the water. 
then I've seen it in floods within a couple years, either through before or after. I've forgotten how that long time ago. I can remember we went to Yuma to see the flood and the highway across the Bard Valley was about that deep in water. And you had to be very careful to go through, get over to the bridge, and chicken coops, huge cottonwood trees, everything flowing down the river. This would have been before Hoover Dam. Oh yeah, all of this before Hoover. Hoover's the salvation of it, of the Hoover Valley. Okay, let's go back to that. Uh, again, I, I'm, I'm trying to, where were you and your family when Hoover Dam was, Black Canyon Dam, was proposed and, and people really started talking about it and this would be a good thing to do. Do you recall that? Well, I can recall, uh, not to the degree you can talk about, but I, I, my dad always took this stand. Oh, I'll tell you one thing that the farmers were promised in those days. We were getting ready to talk about it and then change the subject. They were told if they would mortgage their land to fill the All-American Canal. And in effect, that's what they did by signing the contract, repayment contract. They'd get free power. And I think one of the things that that sold it was the free power. Uh, that never happened. Free. <laughs> free power out of Hoover. Yeah, that, Hoover. that, that the farmers, because after all, they were mortgaging their land for a 30-year repayment to the United States. And so in return for that mortgage, they'd get free power. Who was it that made that promise? The Imperial Irrigation District. In fact, in Arizona versus California, they finally dug up some newspaper clippings that talked about it. And that never happened? Why, of course not. Okay. Uh, but I would say, I can remember this. We had two large newspapers, the Los Angeles Times and the Los Angeles Examiner, first newspaper. There was a time that you probably had a hard time purchasing a Los Angeles Times in Imperial Valley. They were anti Hoover and anti uh, All American Canal. And the reason is that they own hundreds of thousands of acres in Mexicali Valley. They only had, as I recall, only 160 or 320 acres within the United States, and that's where they built their headquarters out, which, by the way, is still standing. You're talking about the, which family of the L.A. Times are you talking about? The, I'm talking about the L.A. Times. Okay. The examiner was pro-canal, pro-dam. So, improvised people as a whole, and I think that was proven if you can find the vote on the Canal was very much in favor. Had to be. Had to be. We had problems in Mexico. The week that I went to work for the Imperial Irrigation District, they sold their uniforms and rifles that they had. Every time there was a revolution in Mexico, they had a group of men who get the uniform and the rifles and run down to the main check gates on the canal in Mexico to be sure to protect the check gates. So the people in Imperial Valley, we knew we were all, it was for the All-American Canal. That name came long before the, the dam authorization. We wanted the canal all on the side of the U.S. Now that okay. and off the record, that's the reason I don't understand Kelly getting this fun into the state to study a canal from Mexicali to San Diego over on the Mexican side. Because of the history of the yeah. first one. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, let's go back just a little bit, if you can. Uh, the dairy farms, why did they disappear? There, there aren't many down there, if any at all. There's uh, a few. 
to me there was two reasons they disappeared. And probably uh, the main reason was the testing for TB. Prior to when that law came in that all cows had to be tested for TB, tuberculosis. Now, I do not know whether a human being gets tuberculosis from drinking milk from a cow. I do not know. But that and the depression killed, in my opinion, killed dairy. My dad had this root. Now, in those days, dairies were small. I think the largest dairy that he had on his root, a man with milk and 80 cows. After the TB testing, he had two cows. And this was just about what happened, Ron. What the government did, they bought the cows and slaughtered them, but they gave the people very, very little money. And so um, that killed it. Plus the fact of depression, nobody had any money. Now, one of the things that I recall that happened when we say before depression, my dad always said the depression started in 1920 as far as farmers were concerned. The rest of the people didn't know about it until 1929. But uh, I can remember, gosh, this was in the, probably in the late 20s, when some dairymen, some of them sold the dairy because there was this idea of growing vegetables. Man, you could make a lot of money on vegetables. Never heard of it. So this was what would typically happen. He would sell his dairy and have money enough to go into farming vegetables. Within a couple of years, you couldn't sell the vegetables. And that's even true today. We have lots of times where a farmer plows up his old vegetable field because the price is so poor. But these people were on sh short time, very little money. And uh, by the time depression came on, they were broke. And uh, uh, you could probably go to the county and found out, but there was an immense amount of property that was owned by tax-supported agencies. Farmers finally had to give up. It was rough in those days. And that's, that's when it changed from dairy into the type of farming today. The small farmer could not last. If he spent his money to grow a crop of lettuce and had to plow it up, he was through. So they were really on a one-year cycle. You either I, made I it can or... remember one of the large farmers down there <coughs> he lived across from my in-laws. He had three or four carloads of lettuce. In those days, nothing was FOB. Everything went consignment sell it for what you could get after he got there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know, remember one night he found about, well, I'm flat broke, but I got three cars of lettuce. If they will hit New York within the next 10 days, I'm all right. Otherwise, I'm bankrupt. And uh, that's, that's a hard way to farm. Well, how did the conversion then <clears throat> from dairy, I mean, Imperial Irrigation District is a huge producer of what they call today food and fiber, cotton, vegetables, edibles, uh, probably one of the largest regions in the country. And they use a lot of Colorado River water, as you know. Did that conversion from dairy to farming happen very suddenly, or did it take a long time to develop? I think World War II made it. In what sense? Prices were good. People buy more land. So that after World War II, I doubt if there's many 40 acres, 80 acres of tracks left. There's a large farm. Now, we still have in our family the original homestead, one of the few families that still has the original homestead. Uh, we lease it out. The guy we're leasing to right now, I think, farms 5,000 acres. What was a homestead? The original one was about 160, 320 in desert. We had a little more than that. But this is type of, it, it evolved from Depression days. World War II is what solved lots of problems. 
and it made it available with finances so we begin to have the large farmers. Uh, we, before we turn the camera on, you, we talked very, very briefly about the 1934 compromise. Uh, what I'd like you to talk about a little bit is the use of water off of the Colorado River, how it was shared in California. Uh, if you recall how that compromise came about and, and what it meant then and, and maybe what it means today. Well, of course, I can't tell you anything about what it meant when it was done because I was too young at that time. But because I've told you that, I'm interested in history. I came down here to this district from the Department of Water Resources in Los Angeles. When you say this district? Coachella District. Now, amazing as it might be to you, at that time the Los Angeles office of the Department of Water Resources had less than 10 people in it. And uh, we had just started working at the department on uh, the well water supply in the Los Angeles basin. I went out and interviewed some of the, the land grant people, the Sepulvas. I still found one of them still alive and talked to them about their early well thing. So the department was building up records and I could see where it was going. So when I came down here to Coachella Valley District, with my background in history, knowing what the department was doing, I tried to find out all the background that I could for Coachella Valley in the district. Um, as time went on and the district had very little money, I was still able to convince the board of directors, don't stop our investigation, our historical background. It's going to have a important sometime. So with that, I interviewed people throughout the valley. I have Two or three of them, I got it on a little tape with the understanding I would never use it until they were dead. And so I found out a lot of the background of how the contract came in and how the uh, compromise agreed. For instance, in the negotiation of Boulder Project, the uh, district were all supposed to pay so much an acre foot for water, rental water. I think MWD still does, 50, 50 cents an acre foot cents. or something like that. Imperial mm -hmm. agreed to that. The Coachella person fought it. He says, if we're going to charge for water, then I want my percent of the power revenues out of Uber if I'm going to pay for water. So that's one of the compromises that, that came to that. So that's a reason from him alone, his name was R.W. Blackburn, him alone is the reason the two irrigation districts do not pay for water, uh, for storage out of Hoover Dam. Um, what are the problems? Now this I have to be hearsay and this hearsay also goes with history. Not only with the, some of the original board members but also with some people in the Bureau of Reclamation. And I've seen some of the letters. But the background of the compromise agreement was the Secretary of Interior at that time, and see your, your my, Mike Ely's father-in-law. He was the Dean of Engineering, I think, at Stanford. What was his name? I, I could go in there in my records and look at that. And we will before we get through if you want it. Anyway, some reason or other, when they negotiate, well, let, let's back up a little now. Let's back up a little. The, the first contracts the district signed for All American Canal was the Kincaid Act back in 1919, 1920. They signed a contract that had to repay. I forget how much money it put up, three or $4,000 to have their share of the study. And so 
the district also was very active in um, the original negotiations in Congress. Phil Swing was the congressman from San Diego Imperial Counties, and they worked with him. And at that time, from what I could read and find out, the district had a young lawyer that was probably 50 years ahead of his time. Things that he would dream about and think about came in, even in my lifetime, when I worked and died, but he thought of it back in then. So the district was very, very active. And so, I see, that was the election in 1928, I think it was, for the Board of Directors. Coachella people had got into two camps because of what the secretary said. The secretary said, I'm only going to sign one contract for the district. We don't need to have a, several contracts for water. Now. I'm going to have one, and we're going to be with the Imperial Irrigation District. So we had two camps in Coachella Valley, one led by the president of the board, R.W. Blackburn, who said, fine, let's join Imperial. We had another group that was led by the Vice President Anderson and some more. They said, absolutely not, we're not going to have anything to do with the Imperial Irrigation District. Off the side, from my standpoint, I believe Coachella would have got water sooner if they joined Imperial. The other side, I think they're very fortunate that they did not join Imperial. So you see, you have those two points of view. Uh, fact is, from uh, Mr. Anderson and also from Mr. Blackburn, I got from the fact that they invited each other to a fight on the stage at the high school where they were debating this project. And what happened in the election, the old board was recalled. So the new board we want our own contract. So the secretary said, settle your difference with Imperial. And in effect, he put a shotgun to the head of Coachella and said, you got to settle your differences, but you're in a bad position. So they settled the differences by the contract, by the compromise contract. Now, Mr. Levy today will tell you that that contract, we'd be better off without it. My own personal thinking is the Coachella District has lost in this negotiation by not holding on to the compromise agreement. Compromise agreement, as you know, says that Imperial cannot deliver any water outside of their boundaries, and all water must be beneficially used. In lawsuits that I've testified that Imperial does not use their water beneficially. Uh, on our own farm down there, you have to, they've changed the rules now, but you get water on a 24-hour basis. The guy gets tired at night, he can turn all the water into the waste ditch get up the next morning and start irrigating again. I know this because it does on our own property. And so that was a stand I always took with Imperial when we were negotiating with him, that you're wasting water. Now that, to me, is the background of the compromise agreement. What did Coachella get out of it? They got out of it that they could have power at the same rate as Imperial for their own facilities. Uh, we had to give up the power right. Well, what if they never got any benefit out of that? There is no benefit for Coachella except that restriction on Imperial, and I guess that's gone now under the new agreements. But to me, that was the strongest thing we had for Coachella. And, and the reason that that was so important, that when I say that, I mean that Imperial could not deliver water outside their service area, is because Coachella stood to 
have available to it whatever water Imperial was not using. Is that correct? No. In talking to Mr. Anderson, he was an older man at that time, he said, we didn't think there was ever going to be any shortage of water. Well, there was plenty of water, so we didn't care. Imperial put that, uh, that uh, in the compromise agreement that they would only beneficially use water on their land because it also applies to Coachella. Coachella can only use water on their, within their boundary, beneficially used. That was kind of a, oh, you know, we're all going to be good, we're going to live together on this. But as Mr. Anderson said, we never dreamed there would be any shortage of water. We weren't worried about it. So I would say they entered the compromise agreement <coughs> at the request of Imperial for Imperial to have all the power facilities. With Coachella, not thinking there's going to be any water shortage. Well, let's go back a minute. Why would Coachella care if, now I'm going back historically, why would Coachella, Valley Water District, care if Imperial delivered water outside of its boundaries? I understand why they would care today. I, I understand what you're saying. I don't know the answer to that. I would say that in those days, Coachella had a shotgun at their head, and uh, they wanted to get something back from the giving up the power. And I would say, of course, they're supposed to get 8% of the net revenues of Imperial, which is really a, uh, a joke. Um, I think it was just put in there to, well, you're giving up this. You've got to get something. So somebody came up with that. I don't think Coachella at that time, from what I could find out, really worried about that because they were going to get all the water they wanted anyway. First time they shot Coachella, in my opinion, was in the Arizona versus California. When we sat up there in that jury, in that courtroom, and had Imperial witness Mike Dowd put in an exhibit that showed the allocation or the diversion of water at the present time, how much left. Imperial Dam, how much went out to Coachella Canal, all the way down, losses and everything. That's today. Then in the corresponding column, future, he showed no water for Coachella. That's when we in Coachella got worried. Up to that time, we'd never been worried about it. That, and that, what, that would have been uh, in the mid-50s? Oh, let's see. The, the case was settled uh, initially. 56, 57, <coughs> 57, 58. Right. No, 56, let's see. I became manager, assistant manager in 56. Really because the manager was an old bureau man. He didn't want to have to go up and testify. So he was in 56, 57, 58. I spent a couple of years off and on in San Francisco. That's when we got worried. That's when we found out up to that time uh, uh, the Bureau had taught us, we'll say prior to my time, it showed how we get water here. You order all the water you want from Imperial Dam. You got too much water down here, you just turn it in salt and sea. And that's when I came home from that trial and told my irrigation people, no more water in the salt and sea. We've got to verify and justify every acre feet of water that comes to our district. The Imperial is going to try to take all of it away from us. Is that because you were worried that they, that the Imperial would claim that you were wasting water in Coachella? Yes. And that was one of my, <coughs> my points that we had against Imperial was they were definitely wasting how would you characterize, over your career in water, which extends some 40, more than 40 years, 
How would you characterize the relationship between Coachella and Imperial? Has it been up and down and up and down, or um, has there always been enmity there? No, I don't think. When I came to Coachella, before World War II, when I got out of junior college, I ran out of money. I couldn't go on to school. So I got a job with the Imperial Irrigation District Survey Party. Because of having two years of college, I got 50 cents a day more than the other people in our same position. I got $3.50 a day, six days a week. So uh, I worked for Imperial practically up until World War II, two years. Then when I came back from the Army, uh, I knew I was going back to school, but I had about six or seven months. So Imperial hired me to run a survey party, and I ran the regional power lines from Imperial to Coachella. Because during World War II, Imperial finally took over, purchased all of the power facilities of the private company. It would cost Southern Sierra Power Company, and then later in Nevada, California, and then well, uh, California, Edison Plain, about the mountain. And uh, so then when I came here to work, a lot of the guys down at Imperial had come up to they were old friends of mine. Uh, you do Bob Carter, and uh, uh, Bob and I had known you for years. We visit every time we did. I'd tell him he was cheating us on power, and he had laughed. Said, "Sure we are, but you can't you can't find out how we are." So <laughs> I would say, "No, there wasn't any fighting or anything. I knew all of them." I had one or two of them down there who was a little jealous because I became a general manager. But that's beside the point. I would say ninety percent of people, ninety-five percent of people, ninety-nine and nine tenths percent of people don't even know anything about the compromise agreement or anything like that. No, I don't think there was any that. It's just that we knew that we had to be on our toes to be sure we kept our water. And I tried for years to get the district to bring an action against Imperial over the power. And our attorney always said, no, we don't want to cause any trouble. Water is more important to Coachella than power. Now, as you know today, Coachella has sued Imperial over power. And I think they're going to win. Did you, when you went to work for Coachella Valley Water District, um, that would have been, I correct me if I'm wrong, please, but I think that would have been the early to mid 50s. It came in October of 1950. Okay. Um, Palm Springs was not what Palm Springs is, of course. Uh, farming was not what it is today, and Imperial was not what it is today. Did yes, Imperial was. I'd say Imperial was quite was. Do you think it was as large then? As oh, sure. It hadn't grown any. Okay. Um, what was what was your vision in 1950 of this general area and what it has become? There's nobody alive that dreamed that we were going to have what we have here in Coachella Valley. Nobody. When I came here in 50, there was, I think, two streets here in Palm Desert. There was nothing in Rancho Mirage. It was Palm Springs and Coachella. Now, go back to the, to the uh, recall in 1928. Prior to that time, Palm Springs was within the Coachella District. And one of the agreements on the side that the new board had, 
it later became known as recall, was that they would let Palm Desert out of the district if the people down there would support them in the recall. That's how Palm Springs is no longer within the district. <laughs> That's well, Palm, Palm Springs, as I re remember some of the things that I read, their argument was, you're spending all the taxpayers' money trying to get Colorado River water into Coachella Valley, not helping us at all. So why should we pay for that? And that made sense in those days. I think they made a mistake now. They'd probably be better off within the district. Uh, you mean within Coachella Valley Water District? Uh, they f they formed at some point they formed their own district called the Desert Water Agency. Oh yeah, that's really new. Yeah, and, w and when did that occur? And why did they even they, that occurred? Become a contractor for the state water project. Okay. So that was their sole per at the time that was their sole purpose for forming. They formed the district and bought out the Palm Springs Water Company. Okay. Uh, Coachella also became a contractor for State Water Project Water, uh, Coachella Valley Water District, uh, and yet they never built any physical connection to the State Water Project. What were the thoughts of the board and the staff when they did become a contractor? Was there a plan to, to physically hook up to the State Water Project? You'll recall it was originally called the Feather River Project. And I started going to meetings and became a member of that at the very beginning. Because we knew we would need more water in the desert. We knew there wasn't enough water. I probably brought in Colorado River water for the lower valley. There wasn't any water for the upper valley. And in those days, we were very naive. We were told the facility would probably run down the ridge line of the mountains all the way to San Diego. And it was going to be pure mountain water. No one ever thought about the Delta when we started this. The Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. Yeah. As oh, opposed to the yeah, Mexican yeah. Delta. No, we're talking state water project right. now. And so uh, uh, that's how we got started. And then uh, when we came into the alignment where we are now, uh, we all knew that we wanted more water. So I was given the uh, open thing to do all I could to, so that we'd be sure to be a contractor. We asked for more water than the state would contract for us. Um, we had several studies made Desert Water Agency by that time was on. And there's two ways you bring water from the state project. One is through the pass, San Gregorio Pass, Banning Beaumont. The other ones go out around the mountains, 29 Palms area, and come in in that direction through, Bar not Marshall, Victorville, hook in there and come around. Desert Water Agency had the uh, Web Association do a couple studies on the going around. We did a small study with Bechtel coming through the San Gregorio Pass. And in those days, I think that the cost was something around uh, $150 million, something like that. I imagine it'd be a half a billion now. So, uh, We came up, I'll put it that way. And I ne negotiated that exchange agreement with Metropolitan Water District, where they could have our water from the state at Lake Paris or wherever they wanted it. And who was your famous water? What was it? That was a very dedicated MWD man, Cooper. Remember your head of your, and Cooper's statement was bucket by bucket. If we give you a bucket of water, you're going to give us a bucket of water. And uh, we negotiate that. And in our last negotiation session, you had a strong board member by the name of Ransom Chase. 
and I demanded that we get a percentage of the power made at Devil's Canyon. After all, if you got our water, we're exchanging water now, bucket for bucket. Therefore, we should get our percent of the power. Oh, Mr. Chase says, if you want this exchange agreement, you're not going to get any power. So we worked out the exchange agreement. Why? It cost $100,000 for a connection to a metropolitan water district versus $100, $150 million for state water. And bucket per bucket is just as wet one as the other. Now, on the side, back in those days, Metropolitan, everybody wanted pure northern water. We wouldn't have to treat it or anything. Uh, it was going to be so wonderful. Uh, you weren't going to have that old hard Colorado River water you were going to exchange. It's amazing to me that down through the years, we don't care where water's hard or not, do we? MWD stopped all their softening plants. and. Uh, San Diego will take Colorado River water. It's changed. But well, we had that problem here in Coachella Valley, especially Palm Street. Had two or three guys up there <gasps> break that Colorado River water and spread it. It's just going to wreck our water. It's going to just be up there. That's all we're going to get. So I'd go to meetings and say, you know, we bring Colorado River water in, then the mountains will rain, and that Whitewater River come in. I said, I don't know whether it makes or not. But the wells aren't just going to pump Colorado River water. They're going to pump all kinds of water. Nowadays, nobody says anything about it. Everybody wants wet water. During that negotiation, you said that Metropolitan was insisting on a bucket for bucket exchange, which is ultimately what happened. Did Coachella have a different view of that? No, not really, except for wanting some power revenue out of it. We figured that was not quite bucket for bucket. So the, <laughs> so, the, so the water exchange itself was a pretty cordial uh, Oh, very much so. Fact is, uh, and I guess uh, Jim Krieger pushed this, not the attorney, but the young Jim from MWD. Uh, they they put up most of the money of building the spreading works that we have up at Palm Springs area. You've seen those. Okay. And uh, MWD put up much most of the money for that. Let's. Uh, you want to take a break? Are you okay? You uh, you're fine. Unless you, you want to use the restroom? No, no, no. Um, let's talk a little bit, uh, Lowell, about the the growth of the Coachella Valley Water District and the the increase of its importance. Because I think when you joined the district, there were probably only about forty people working there, and I think today it's probably more like. 400. Um, what the heck are they doing? What did you do while you were general manager to grow that district uh, from what it was to what it is today? When I came to work there, I came to work as an expert on salinity problems worked in Imperial Valley. I knew how, we thought we knew how to solve the salinity problem by tile drainage, outlet drains. And so the uh, people here in Coachella Valley, I'll start over. The general manager at that time worked for Imperial prior to World War II. So I knew it. And during the war, when the canal construction stopped, he was visionary enough to recognize that there was going to be an agricultural drainage problem, salinity problem, here in Coachella Valley. They already had a salinity problem. In the lower valley, when the water, when the basin was full of water, there was enough factors that water had come to the surface for centuries. And evaporated off and left the salt. Now, here at Old Water Man, you know that there's soft water and hard water. 
the old saying is in agriculture, hard water makes soft land, and soft water makes hard land. Basically, hard water is calcium water. Soft water is sodium. And so the sodic soils are much harder to reclaim than the calcium soils in drainage. White alkali, black alkali. We don't use those terms anymore, though. White alkali is calcium. Black alkali was sodium. We call that sodic soils now. They had that problem. So even in the early 20s, the district at that time had installed a few observation wells around the lower valley to check on the salinity. So when Mr. Snyder, who was the manager of the district, came out of Imperial Valley, manager of this district, in negotiating the uh, all American, the Coachella branch of the All-American Canal, he knew that we're going to have this salinity problem. So he organized what was called the Coachella Valley Cooperative. The members, members of that was, Metro, was the uh, Bureau of Reclamation, the University of California, the United States Department of Agriculture, representing with their salinity laboratory in Riverside, and the Water District. It was the four of those. And so, after water was going to get here, water got here in 1949. Water from the Colorado, Colorado River. River through the canal. And so uh, the person that I had worked with in drainage in Peril Valley, who was a contractor, guy, and we had worked together at the Imperial before he went out into private business, he called me and he told me, he said, you know, I think there's a wonderful opportunity in Coachella might go down there and get on the ground floor. On Columbus Day in 1950, which I had a holiday for the Department of Water Resources, my wife and I drove to <coughs> Coachella Valley, and uh, it uh, was pretty pretty rough area at that time. And uh, this is a long-winded answer to your question. That's fine. So we came down on, a, and this is beside the point, we came on Columbus Day. We left here about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, stopped in Indio to get gasoline. It was 112 by the thermometer there. Got in the car, my wife says, you know, there's one thing we've made a decision on, is we're not moving to Coachella Valley. Prior to this, when my brother, who was the assistant city clerk at city of Los Angeles for years. When he heard I was looking at this, he came over to tell me, Lord, don't go down there. The horrible desert, we all left there, don't go back. Anyway, that's what my wife said, October 12th. Two weeks later, I was working down here. <laughs> for the six, first six months down here, I don't think my wife hardly spoke to me in a nice way. After that, I couldn't even get her to go to Los Angeles for any reason whatsoever. Now, when I went to work for the district, there must have been 40 or 50 people. I went to work in November. In January, they fired the general manager. So my wife said, well, We've had it already, haven't we? I said, I guess. I hired a new general manager, a city boy. It was a just tragedy. He had no concept how to deal with the people down there, because it was a farm district. And uh, he lasted two years, and they fired him. And during about this time, the system was constructed, as you know, by the Bureau. It's an all-pipeline system. Best engineering to be done. 
but we couldn't serve water. The day that I came to work, the water master took me out to show me some of the problems. They had shut down, turned the entire canal into the Salton Sea, shut down the whole system trying to solve some of the problems. Now, the Bureau had already worked on some of the problems, but they didn't work. <clears throat> Let me tell you this type of, I, I say the Coachella District is a covered over open ditch system. Now, you know in Imperial Valley, an open ditch system, the water runs down the canal, you have a check gate that raises the water high enough to go out the farmer's ditch. That's the same thing here, except it's a pipeline. So the check gate is within a pipe stand. The pipe stand's probably 48 inches. It has a concrete baffle up the center. So the water comes down the line. It backs up the height of that baffle to go over. That baffle is a check gate so that it sends the water out through the meter to the farmer. Now you're with me. Right. These standpipes are every quarter of a mile because it was built for 40, 80 acre delivery. I'm an engineer. This, what, what is all the story for this background that you asked? I went out as an engineer and he took me up and on a ladder so we could look in the standpipe. We're up 10 feet in the air. There's the water coming down, climbs up over, goes on down. Pretty soon there's no water coming. And in a little bit, this water comes backwards. It climbs over that stand. Backwards. Now, also, we went to an area where the water's up high on that stand. We open the meter out here, and no water will run. This system was a nightmare to operate. What was the problem? Well, the Bureau finally decided the problem is that we had a capillary motion. What's the official name? Being we were so every quarter of a mile in effect, you got this. The water was trying to balance itself. No, I don't know where you call it balance or not. It was just the movement of the earth that caused the problem. So this was a, this was a problem that this new manager had to deal with. And plus the fact, we had this terrific moss problem. That's the reason they shut down the system because the meters were full of moss. And remember, every water here, farmers go through a meter, similar to your house meter. And the meters get plugged up. So if a meter gets plugged up, this is an open pipeline system. This meter up here gets plugged up, more water goes down, plugged up. So you're at the end, that farmer's down there getting flooded. All right. At the head of the pipeline system, the Bureau had installed screens in front of the outlet to keep this debris out. They had no concept of how much debris was in the water. So that those screens would get plugged up to no water is going down the line. Absolutely not a drop. So we had screen cleaners that would come by, and it was, uh, took two men and a boy to pull those things out. <coughs> they'd pull the screens out to get this debris off. Well, when they pull it out, a slug of water goes down. That farmer down at the end is flooded. He went out and he didn't have any water. And then pretty soon he's being flooded. That was the type of a system we had here. Modern, but unworkable. And so, they let that manager go, and they brought in and hired the 
Bureau of Reclamation construction engineer that had been in charge of the construction. The way he constructed it, he could operate it. The guy didn't know any more about it than the rest of us. About that time, now we're in 1956, Arizona versus California is coming. I'm convinced he did not want to testify because he had his retirement. He thought he'd be testifying against the government. And so he resigned. First, he took a six months <coughs> leave of absence to work for the contractor that built this system, who had a contract in Kern County to build some of their system. And so uh, the district board hired me as then as the uh, temporary manager while he was gone. Now I should have said that when I came down here, there was no organization whatsoever. So the general manager hired me in October. In December, he asked me to form an engineering department. So I was the head of the engineering department from there and until April of 1956 when I became the temporary manager. Well, the water master and I decided we were going to solve the problem, and we did. But we took away some of the automatic facility parts of it. In other words, of letting that water run over that baffle we knocked a hole in the baffle and put a gate in it. So we undershot. We kept the air out. A harmonic motion is the word I was thinking of. And we got rid of that harmonic motion so we were able to serve water. We solved most of the problems in that six months. When, that, when the manager came back, he never said a word to me. And he worked about two months and then he resigned. And that's when the district board then made me the permanent manager. First trip I took to Washington with them was probably after I was a manager for about three months. And I worked out a table of organization. And I showed them where we had 70 employees, I could get by with 40. We were just a little irrigation district, really. We had flood control powers. We are a flood control district for Coachella Valley. Uh, I think we had two old dozers and about three men that were working on little channels trying to handle the flood. Well, as the as the farming grew, I think there was sixteen thousand acres when I came here. And when I left, there was something close to 70,000 acres. So the farming increased. And in the very early 1960s, again, you have to digress a little. Coachella Valley was way over here from Riverside, we're in Riverside County. We didn't get the services. So throughout the valley, we organized, we organized a Coachella Valley Advisory Planning Department. It wasn't any department, just we citizens, so that we could have some influence with the Board of Supervisors. And uh, I was very active in that. And so uh, in the early 60s, well, that back up again. Palm Desert was just a community, no, no city, just a community. So there was a group of men in Palm Desert, he had grown a little bit. Uh, <coughs> they were, uh, they were a pseudo city council. It's, you know, when you go back to this, it's really kind of funny if you could get all of the history of it. And so they came to the district board and said, hey, look, in effect, they said this. You guys have been spending money for water for the farmers all these years. You know we're going to have shortage of water. We want you to start 
looking out for water for us. Long story short, the Lord gave me the authorization to enter in to purchase all the private water companies in the valley. We purchased some. Some was given to us. Some I refused to take unless they spent some money and brought their old system up to where we would accept it. And that's how we got into the domestic water. When I look at today, with all the money this district got, they just throw it around. I would have on weekends, a pipeline would break. We had no money to replace it. And if it took a point that I just couldn't serve water, Mom does it for instance, the president of the board would take it on himself to guarantee me $2,000 to buy some pipe water. That was the beginning of our domestic water. Uh, as you know, down in irrigation, we're considered one of the foremost irrigation districts in the country. We developed that first, uh, what do we call it now, telemetry. In those days, it was telemetry, oh, okay. in which we could control all of our canal gates. No, well, that's another story. Let's stay with this. So we were in water all over the valley, little company, one well company, no uh, one well company area, no standby or anything. So down through the years, as the valley grew, we were able to combine the systems and with where we are now. Oh, in the late 60s, must have been the late 60s, uh, the Mission Hills Country Club, if you know where that is, over near Palm Springs. Mm -hmm. Developer wanted to develop that. And he had to have a sewer system. Or at least he did not have to have it, but he, he felt that that would be the best thing for him to sell. And so they put up the money for the sewer lines. I think the district put up the money for a small treatment plant back up a little though. Just prior to that, we purchased the water on what is now Palm Desert Country Club over near Indio. <coughs> and they had a little sewer system, so we taken that over. So we had that one. It was nothing. But then we built this larger plant. And the pipelines were laid from Palm Desert all the way up to Mission Hills, which is between Rancho Mirage spring. So that's how we got the sanitation system. And as you do that, of course, you grew. I think when I retired, we had close to 400 employees. So I was a typical bureaucrat. I really grew. But uh, then during this time, we had a big flood here. 75 and had no one in 76. And uh, I had been preaching flood. I'd had meetings with people saying, we need to spend some money. We've got to do something flood. But it was a joke. Here in the desert, who you have any flood? Uh, I don't have to worry about it. So we had, as a flood control district, every time a de uh, de development was by, we had a rule on it. And so our attorney came up with the same thing. We'd say, this is uh, protected except from rare and unusual floods, which we didn't find. So that's the way we did every one of them. It was a joke. It didn't. And uh, one of the things we had to fight, we had some people wanting to subdivide the whole Whitewater River in the Palm Springs area. Not even have a channel. We had to fight that. Well, as I say, I had been out giving talks here in Palm Desert, I had an engineer stand up and said, Weeks is so haywire. So all you need to do is dig about 10, take a post hole digger, 12 inch, and dig about six holes in your backyard and fill it with gravel. That'll take care of all the flood. The following year, we had a flood. 
that we would break out the front windows of the houses that had floor to ceiling and put in scoop shovels to get the mud. I've seen mud up to the ceiling. So that meant that we really had to get into flood control. So we hired Bechtel to do all our flood control things and we started. Most of them was pay your own. Uh, here in Palm Desert, I help organize, and I'm absolutely against it, but I help organize a redevelopment agency here to have to build a flood control. Did the same thing in Renter Mirage, same thing down La Quinta. So except for this area north of 10 and the farming area down on 86 for the county line, this area is protected by a for a standard project flood. I don't know you, you, how much work you've done in flood control, but the standard is a hundred year flood. Well, the guy I hired got to be in charge of my engineering department, he and I did some work on some areas that we could work on, get information. One of the best is a Boulder Creek out of Denver. They've got such good records there. And they had 100 year flood three years in a row. <laughs> so what we did then, we said we're not gonna have our standard 100 year, we have ours as standard project. Now standard project is a core of engineer standard. And what the standard project is, you find the biggest storm that ever occurred in your area and you drop that on your drainage area, and you compute the amount of water that's going to come out. And if you haven't had enough rainfall, find another area that has bigger rainfall and bring it over. So that's what we did. All of our facilities, except the dike by the canal down in the lower valley that the Bureau built, all the facilities we built in standard project. Well, politically, you have to put a annual on it. The newspapers understand what a 100 year flood, but they don't understand it's a standard project. So the Corps of Engineers overlooked our work, saw what we were doing. So they said that here in the desert, the standard project flood is probably a one in 250 to 300 year flood. So that brought in a lot more employees. A lot of this work went for contract, we did a lot of it for the county, and uh, so that's what great brought the district day. I laugh and say that uh, I had more fun than anyone else could ever have because I changed the district from just an agricultural district to a very modern urban district. Now the guys today can get new equipment, better treatment, but they don't have the fun of changing the whole thing. So. That's the way I look at it. Now that, that's the background on how we got the size it is today. Okay, let me, uh, let me, uh, I'm not even going to ask a question. I'm just going to give you the name of an agency or an event and just give me your thoughts about that agency or event uh, historically or Salton Sea. What do you want to know about Salton Sea? You know how it was formed. Well, I do, but I get mad at the at the newspaper communists who talk about the big flood that broke the dikes, which it wasn't done that way. The canal was hoping was built without a check gate. That was a problem. You knew that. So you want me to talk about that? Oh, yes, I do. Oh. Yeah. Well, in the, in the development of the canal system in Imperial Valley, the whole idea was to divert water from the California side. They wanted definitely to have a California or U.S. water right. But the sand dunes area in Imperial Valley at that time made it impossible to keep the canal within the United States. So the canal went across the border into what is now the town of Alcadones and it joined an old overflow channel from the Colorado River. 
Now, most people don't realize that the Colorado River itself sets up higher than the surrounding land. And that's true with every major river because as the floods come, they deposit the, the silt on the sides of the, of the channel and then further out, it doesn't do deposit anything, so it's always higher. So during the, before man was in here, the Colorado River would divert itself build up a dam so it couldn't go into the Gulf, then it would form Salton Sea. Salton Sea has been formed several times and dried out. Then the channels to Salton Sea would be silted up, and the water then go back to the Gulf. So these old channels was available, and we'll talk about the one that's called the, uh, the Alamo River within the United States, which came out of below Alcadones, traveled around the sand dunes west to Imperial Valley, entered the uh, United States, a little area called Bonds Corner, and it flows down in the eastern part of the valley, it's on the sea. So the D California Development Company was developing this new water system. They diverted the water in the United States, paralleled the river down, I think it was about two or three, three or four miles, below the international boundary where they hit this old Alamo channel. And they released the water into that. They went downstream several miles, probably 40, 45 miles, and built a, a structure to block the water from the channel and divert it into canals into the Imperial Valley. Well, the river is running so high of silt that I believe it was the winter of 1903 early spring of 1904, I have to get my notes out, that uh, the intake area in the United States was very flat. The silt dropped out and it filled it up. So they were concerned that for the season of 1904, they would not have water for the farmers because the canal was so silted up. So the decision was made was to go downriver into Mexico, three or four miles, and build a new channel from the river directly into the Alamo Channel. The floods on the Colorado River are always in late May to June. It takes that long for the melt in the Rockies to get down to the Yuma area. So when they decided to build this canal, and here again is an amazing thing, even the Imperial Irrigation District, they never dealt with the government. They worked directly with Mexico. And so the developers were the same way. When they were down in Mexico, they didn't have any, they didn't go through State Department or anything, they worked directly with Mexico. So there's, they had the plans for this check tape structure that they were going to build it. You never open into a river without some type of control section facility. So they sent the plans down to their lawyer in Mexico, and they didn't get a report. By September, I believe it was, why he finally said, well, they're going to approve it. Now remember, Mexico does not have a congressional record, so you, you can't go back into records to find. And so he said, they'll approve it. So they started digging it and they dug the canal. And this is winter time, there's no water hardly in the Colorado River, so they didn't have any problem. They keep contacting their attorney, couldn't get approval of the structure. And so in the next year, and I may be off, The engineer made the cut in September 1904. Now remember, the floods don't come until May and June, so we had plenty of time to build the structure. Unfortunately, there was a flood on the Gila River, and the first flood was in February of 1905. Now 
they've been building this in the fall of four. So, uh, well, that wasn't too bad. They could still live with that. Then they had a second one late February. They had a third one in March. And in uh, June, we hit the flood season. By November 1905, 110,000 cubic feet per second was flowing out towards the salt sea. Canal, the break was probably a half a mile wide. And so then they spent all the time trying to get it done. And as you probably know, <coughs> it was only until the Southern Pacific finally entered into the That's a little foreign history. Theodore Roosevelt. He, could, he had no authorization to spend money on this. The draw was down in Mexico. And so he asked Mr. Harriman, the president, to close the gap because the company had had three or four closures. They'd build dams, checked all the way across, and then they'd wash out on them. And uh, he told Harriman that the government would pay for it. Harriman was president of Southern, Southern Pacific, and uh, they never got paid. Never got paid. Congress refused to pay. But they made money with all the. <laughs> okay, we were talking about that canal, and so uh, it was finally fixed. <coughs> the company was broke. So that's when the people in Imperial Valley organized the Imperial Irrigation District. And I believe in 1916 they bought and paid for all the works and became the district. Prior to this time, the, the whole thing was the company was going to own all the diversion works and all the main canals. Then they'd form mutual water companies. I think actually there was seven of them formed. There may have been seven or eleven. I forgot how many. been eleven. And the little mutual water companies then would finance whatever as they could do to build the interior, the interior canals and deliver water to the farmer. This so is when Imperial. Imperial took over, it became one, one district, which was the ideal way to do it. Okay. Um, your thoughts? Your oh, thoughts? on Salton Sea? I, I've, fish on salt sea in the early days. Uh, I was on salt sea on Mullet Island, which you can't even, <coughs> can't even get to now, at uh, Pearl Harbor Day. I had already received my draft notice to go, so that meant it was going to go faster then. So see, I, I, I know the Colorado River and salt sea. I think you do. Um, the tr uh, treaty with Mexico guaranteeing them 1.5 million acre feet, uh, is that something you were comfortable with? It was before you joined the district. Oh, of that, course, was done, but, uh, uh, that was done right after the war. Right. So I had nothing to do okay, so, so by the time you became involved in water in this neck of the woods, uh, it just that just wasn't an issue. and. It, that just goes on. Um, the uh, United States Bureau of Reclamation, uh, thoughts about their work historically? When I came to work for the district, I was horrified to find out Maybe not horrified. I guess he was horrified to find out how much battle there was going on between the district, and when you say the district, that's your director, the board, and the Bureau of Reclamation. I guess I felt they should probably work together. And I really got me was when uh, I hadn't been here very long, when they were going to meet with some of the regional, I guess with the regional director, it may have been one of the undersecretaries, that they bugged the room they were going to 
Yeah, and in those days we didn't have all of the VCRs and the, that we have today. But they bugged the room so they could get it down, whatever the directors thought. And I thought, uh, if you can't say something face to face, that's kind of funny. So after I became manager, and with our attorney, who was a very, very shrewd old gentleman, Earl Redvine. And with our board, our board set a policy that we should be on first name relationship with any and all commissioners or reclamation, and that we should be able walk into the Secretary of Interior's office, and we did that all those years. And so we worked, I thought, very closely with the Bureau. We really didn't have much to do with the Bureau. Under the, our contract with the Bureau, they had the right to inspect the canal to be sure that we were keeping it up. I think they inspected it twice. In the, 30 some odd years I was there. I don't think they ever came down to it the last 20 years. Um, I don't recall any really bad really. In fact, is I thought we were on good relations. We, we got organized, and I think the Bureau organized that. We had the Imperial Dam cooperatives. Wish everybody that got water from Imperial Dam, both in Arizona and California, we met once every three months with the Bureau. Even after the Bureau turned over the Imperial Dam to um, IID, Imperial, uh, we still met. No, I don't, I don't know. Uh, we got a we got a stormwater dike built on the west side of the valley by Bureau money, by uh, redevelopment contract, I think that's what it was. And you, you, had to, you had to put your tongue in cheek to justify it, but the Bureau justified several million dollars in building that. Uh, under that, we did a lot of, that's where we first got our money for the, really the first uh, delivery system. We put, they put it, we, they financed us to put in new check gates uh, so that it would operate easier under telemetering control. So, you know, I would say, you know, we lined the first uh, 49 miles of the Coachella Canal across the desert. You wouldn't know how that happened. Well, I do want to know how that happened, but before you tell me that, uh, you said earlier uh, you used the term bugged, uh, talking about the Bureau, and, and I, I assume that they simply, that what you mean by that is that they had recording devices there to record everything. They weren't secretly They bugged. were in another room, hidden microphones. Oh, you did mean bugged. Okay, oh, well, yes. I'm glad, okay, I'm glad I cleared that up. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> I was amazed. Okay, all right. Let's now that we have that cleared up. Let's let's go back to uh, this line of the canal, and this is where the compromise agreement comes in from my standpoint. We were losing out of our canal about a hundred and thirty thousand acre feet a year in seepage. This is out of the Coachella Canal. Out of Co the Coachella branch Co of the Co canal. I always figured that was water not going to a bank to be repumped, but a paper water bank. That if we ever lined the canal, that was going to be our answer of additional water. In other words, we were getting so much water that we were using, but we were diverting a lot more. And to me, I felt if we ever lined the canal, that diverted water was ours because it was being lost anyway. We lined the canal, it should be ours. So that was a principle that I sold the board on. But we didn't have any money. And 
about this time, let's see, that would be President Nixon. I think it was President Nixon appointed a former, or was it, yeah, yeah. former Attorney General Brownell as his special assistant to solve the problem with Mexico. Mexico is making a lot of noise about the solidity of the Colorado River. The Welton Mohawk District in Arizona had a terrific, they put in a drainage system, and they were dumping a terrific lot of salt water into the Gila River. That flowed into the Colorado below Imperial Dam, so it didn't have much water to mix with, and Mexico was getting a lot of salt water. And there was a lot of pressure from Mexico on our government. So uh, Ron L. was supposed to <coughs> come up with a recommendation to solve the problem, but not to hurt United States interests. So we had a bus trip with him and Imperial, through Imperial Valley. And so we were all assigned three seats on the bus president, vice president, and myself. And then as we drive around the valley, Brownell would have some different ones come down, set and see what you know, talk about the area. I'd already convinced the board that maybe this was an opportunity that we could get a loan from the government to uh, line that leaky canal. And that way we'd have water. I should buy, uh, go back a little. In the contract from Imperial Dam down to, well, Imperial Dam in the entire All American Canal, San Diego has a right for 150? 105. 105, whatever it is, uh, acre feet a year. And they have owned that percent of the canal. So we came up and I talked to our attorney. I said, you know, if we someday we're going to line the canal and we need to have the right to this water, but we need more water because we only have a right for 1,500 CFS, I think, in the main All-American. We're going to need to get old more so we can bring that extra water in so we can use it. So we attempted to buy San Diego's capacity in the All-American Canal down to Coachella Edwards. We, we appeared in the City Council of San Diego. We, they approved it. We had approved contract. And the Bureau would not agree to it. Their attorney at that time kept wanting to know, what do you want it for? What's your purpose? And we wouldn't tell him. We didn't want to get into the seepage problem with the Bureau at that time. So we never get, went forward with it. And uh, San Diego City Attorney was just furious because they felt, boy, well, here, it wasn't a lot of money, but it looked good to them to show it that. So we had that background. So. I convinced the board that we could. So I, I asked him that day. I said, when well, Ronnell, if he asked me to come down, can I proposition the government to mine the canal? If you can sell it, sell it. So uh, when I talked to him, and he was talking about the canals and things, and I mentioned the fact that he was looking for water. And that's what he was doing. He was looking for water to dilute that well, Mohawk. So I laid out a proposition to him and bought it. That's how we got the first 50 miles line. And under our contract with him, as long as the United States needs the water, we do not make a payment for that year on that line canal. Some way or other, the United States has taken the stand if they need the water or something, Coachella has never made a payment on that canal. Then at the same time, 
I negotiated an agreement with Metropolitan Water District that the denominator is 132,000 acre feet. We line the canal. If MWD takes half of that, 62,000, whatever it is, they pay half the payment, and we pay half the payment. I don't know where MWD has ever made any payment or not, but Coachella has never made a payment on that 50 miles of country line. So I think I get a good job for the people in this district. <laughs> was a good deal. <laughs> of course, Myron helped me on that. Um, okay, continuing uh, just with your thoughts about various people and agencies and concepts, uh, Metropolitan Water District. I always had an excellent relationship with them. Hank Mills is the one that uh, insisted that I be president of that first uh, state contractors group that we had. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got the exchange agreement with Metropolitan. We got money enough for, to build a spreading area. Uh, I guess I've always been in the Metropolitan pocket. I've always <laughs> felt that they were a great organization when I was working. I don't know anything about it now. Okay. No, that's fine. It became a more of a political organization. Back in my days, it was an engineering water delivery organization. Uh, how about Arizona v. California? You've mentioned that several times, and you testified as part of that suit, which goes on today. Uh, it's a difficult answer, I suppose, for you to give, but just generally what are your memories about the beginnings of that lawsuit? I really don't know what you're talking about or what your question is. Uh, okay, what my you, memory of this is the fact that Arizona made a mistake. In my opinion, if they sued the state of California, they'd done maybe not better, but sooner. But the mistake they made, they sued all the agencies in California that use water. And I'm sure they thought they would divide us and we would be fighting one another. Instead, we closed ranks and we did not fight one another. The closest that, that any dispute that Coachella might have was when we were rudely awakened to the fact the Imperial felt that someday they'd cut all of our water off, as I've already mentioned. But other than that, it was strictly Arizona trying to fight us. I remember that, uh, I remember I was a young man then, and I can remember when I was called, and I was called prior before we put our testimony on because we had hired W. Penn Rowe to be our consultant, to be the one that would testify. And when we came back off of a recess after Imperial had put on their case, under some way or other, uh, I'm sure it was before we did our testimony, the uh, Arizona was able to call me as a, some type of rebuttal witness or something, enemy witness, friend witness, I don't know what, because they wanted to get in on the salt and sea. And I know Imperial helped their breath. And after all, I was a young man. I wasn't used to being on a witness stand and things like that. And before long, special master take over. And here I'm seated the chair, and he's right there. And he and I was carrying on a conversation. The Arizona attorney's trying to stop us. So. Uh, I think that we did very well on that suit. I think the one thing that the special master was unfair to California is when he would not allow Arizona rivers to be included within the quantity of water that Arizona's booked to get. I still think that's a mistake. 
as a layman, you read the the compact, it certainly says all tributaries with the United, within the United States. Uh, it was an interesting time. Uh, we stayed away from the Arizona people. We didn't even go out to Denver in those days. Uh, later on, had a lot of dealings with them on other things that uh, no problem. I think the friendship with Arizona started with uh, Joe Jensen. From MWD? And I think Joe Jensen was a man that has not been given the credit that he but after Arizona versus California, he came to the decision, Arizona going to get their share of the water politically. They're going to get their canal, so let's quit fighting with the river. So I can remember the first meeting we had with the people in Arizona. We invited them over, I think, with that Metropolitan Board. Or did we meet off the airport? Anyway, the first meeting, it was very, it was very strained. Uh, everybody was very careful. That's when Jensen said, we're in this together now. And so we would be, what, every six months, first in Arizona, here in California. So we all got very well acquainted with one another. But Jensen started that. I still think he was a marvelous man. I know that a lot of people hated his guts. Well, that, that may have been true at the time, but I think history has... Uh has softened that a little bit, and I think a lot of people feel the, the way you do, uh, looking back historically what he was able to accomplish. Are there any other people, Lowell, that, uh, you know, reaching back into the 40s and 50s, uh, any other individuals that come to your mind that um, were particularly important? To maybe, maybe they didn't become famous, but in your relationships with them were particularly important in the development of either Colorado River water for California or water in general. Uh, you mentioned Joe Jensen. I, I would think, and uh, maybe I have to, people here in this valley have always said I had a rubber stamp board. They did whatever I said to do. But people don't understand I did my homework. And the board knew everything I was going to do. I've had developers want me to bring up things to the board, which I knew the answer would be no. I refused to do it. I wasn't going to embarrass them. So I would say probably one that stands out was the president of our board for many years, Leon Kennedy. He had, he had confidence in me, and uh, he supported me in everything that I wanted. But I was, I think, intelligent enough, smart enough not to ask for things that I knew I shouldn't have. And so uh, I would say that was one that I would look back. I remember one thing. I fired a man, absolutely incompetent, sleeping on the job. And he went to one of the board members and crying about how unfair I was. So this board member went to Kennedy, who was the president, and said, we got to have a personnel meeting over this. He said, this, this is something we got to do. So Leon said, fine, let's have the meeting. I'll tell you what's going to be the first item on the agenda. You fire Lowell Weeks. Well, I didn't mean that. Well. If you don't mean that, then what are we having the meeting for? <laughs> so I guess that's the reason. He was the type of man that uh, he could see in the future that uh, we we're going to need more water. We could see some growth in the Upper Valley. We never knew there was going to be a hundred golf courses here in the Valley. But we knew that it was growing. And that's really we went out for state water. So I would say any one person that stands out for me would be him. Probably the second one, who you knew, was Ray Remmons. He just followed along the same line. So, uh, but Leon was first and probably foremost as far as I'm concerned. 
statewide. I felt like we had a lot of weak people statewide. And I'm sure you did too. Wait. No, we're okay for that. Statewide, uh... I didn't see any strong people up there. Harvey Banks? Maybe yes. No, I would say yes to Harvey Banks. I was thinking of the more of the ones since that time that took over the department. I never saw any strong people up there. Pat Brown? Mm -hmm. I never had any contact with him except one time in a meeting I would talk and first thing he asked me, how many voters do you have in your valley? So I recognized immediately what he was after. I will give him credit for the state water project. I don't think anybody else could have put it over. But I, I had nothing to do with him. Uh, Bill Warren was interesting. I recall we had a meeting in the Biltmore Hotel with several representatives from the water people. Mr. Jensen, two or three for MWD, Oliver, we were all meeting there. Going to meet this new director, Bill Warren. Bill Warren walked in, and we had name tags on. He went over to me and says, how's your sister Willie coming along? His folks farm next to my folks in Imperial Valley. He went to high school with my older brothers and sisters. Here, all the others are scared to death to meet this Bill Warren, and he comes over and asks me how my sister is. So that was it. I like Bill. Fact is, I went on after we both retired. We were on a conference in uh, Greece. We went on a five-day bus trip together. I think uh, uh, Warren was a good politician. But he knew he had his feet on the ground. Um, I'm just trying to work out this tape here because I don't want to stop you in mid-answer, and I think we're okay here. Uh, how about on the federal level? Do you need to go to the bathroom? No, I do. Okay, let's uh, change tapes.